Hi, I am Lauren Tate Baeza. I am the Fred and Rita Richmond Curator of African Art at the High, and I'm here to answer some of your questions. My department is not defined by medium, it's not defined by historical period, uh, it is a geographically defined department, and so my intention is to stay within pretty specifically the geographical parameters um, that define the title of my department, and that is the, the large, the massive continent of Africa. Um, and because of that, I, I do not plan to collect um, Black American art. Um, the High Museum of Art has an American art department, and um, Black American art, of course, is integral to the American art canon. And uh, if people are interested in this, I highly recommend um, Holly, the curator of American art at the High's AMA. She did one of these, and in it, she talks about Black American art in the collection. Um, aside from our American art collection, um, Black American artists are represented in our art collection, photography, and folk art, and internally the institution is really encouraging um, collecting more diversely than we had historically across gender lines as well as racial and ethnic lines. Um, and so I said all that to say um, collecting Black American art is not the work of the African Art Department, rather it's the work of the entire institution, and I'm happy to report that the institution is doing that work. Some institutions, uh, organizations, or corporations, they're structured in such a manner that um, the vision um, uh, or even the specific action items under a vision uh, are very top down. And if it's a smaller institution, a lot of times that comes from the head of the institution. If it's a, a, a little bit of a bigger institution, it might come from a small committee of executives or a couple of board members, and they have an idea about do and then everyone else is hired to help execute that idea and that's one model for an organization I feel fortunate <laughs> to work in a place that has a different model um, where not only uh, do I feel safe to voice my opinions and ideas but there's an expectation that I do um, that we all lend our expertise where relevant and share and communicate and communicate again uh, about those things and so when you work in an institution that's very top down and you don't have a lot of creative input, you can certainly, you know, live for, you know, <laughs> unsolicited advice or cold pitch something. But, and that has worked for me sometimes. But it's nice to work for a place where you're just directly asked, what do you think? And it's the simplest thing in the world, but I think a lot of organizations don't run that way, um, where they're asking their staff members, what do they think? and really getting the value of the talent that they have. Um, I have a good friend uh, who runs an arts organization in Darwin. Um, her name is Rebecca Corey. It's called the Classy Art Space. And she and I have talked numerous times about how collaboration is not efficient. It's not, it's not at all. But it's, it is the absolute route to the best outcomes. It's messy and it's slow, but it's how you get stuff. And so I feel fortunate to work in a place where that is a part of the workplace culture. Um, because I knew I don't have an answer for this question that really speaks to the logistics of my job, I haven't done everything in my job yet. Um, but I, I feel like I'm in a place where I get to collaborate with really talented people and where my voice is welcome. Uh, the High Museum of Art has been collecting African objects for decades. And along the way, it uh, amassed a collection that is disproportionately um, inclusive of objects from the modern day uh, of Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Ivory Coast. And, and those places represent about half of the total African art collection. And so my plan is to sort of lean into that uh, and build upon this point of vision. Um, and I plan to do so by diversifying our offerings from West and Central Africa. Uh, there exists substantive opportunity to, to do so and to convey a more complete and dynamic cultural understanding of those regions. Um, and while our collection has objects from all regions of Africa, uh, I, I'm just most excited about further enhancing um, an already uh, sort of existing um, 
regional area of expertise. No, I feel excited, I feel grateful, I feel honored, I want to roll up my sleeves and get to work. Um, I look forward to collaborating with incredible artists and other curators. I feel a lot of things. I think accomplished is a little bit outside of my, the way that I experience things. Um, it's, you know, I, I think I am, if I live a long and healthy life, I'm about at the halfway mark. Um, and, you know, I'm not through the halfway mark of my life's to-do list. So to me, it's hard to stop and feel accomplished when I have one achievement, um, when I know that I have so much more that I plan to achieve. And so maybe one day I'll be comfortable with that language in my 70s and retired and sitting out in my, my mountain home with my beautiful views and sit and think to myself, ah, I feel so accomplished. But right now, I just don't experience things that way. I, there's too much work to do. So I only ever really have two pieces of advice to give people um, in terms of aspirations and pursuing goals, whether you want to be a curator or not. Um, and those two pieces of advice go hand in hand. The first is that you lead with your passion. Um, I think that in uh, the pursuit of the things that we want, you have to be, you have to have wherewithal and you have to be consistent and you have to fight through things and you have to think creatively and um, you're more inclined to do that if you absolutely love the thing you're going after. If you have lukewarm feelings, it's going to be hard to keep up the stamina and to continue to work hard and make sacrifice if necessary. It's not going to want to because you don't really care that much about the thing. Do the thing that you can't stop thinking about. That's exactly where you should be. And it's not even a, sort of a, a whimsical follow your passions. It's actually quite practical. It, it really is because everything else will, will feel like a waste of your time anyway. And you're probably going to be successful. Your likelihood of being successful if you're something you absolutely can't stop thinking about is actually quite high. So you can do the thing you think is more practical or what have you and find your way back to the thing you're passionate about anyway, or you can just delve into the thing you're passionate about from the beginning. And I, I, I've never seen it lead people astray uh, to do that. And then the second piece of advice that I have is there are no rules. I think that in the West, uh, in particular, we're a culture to think that the route to a goal or, or a particular outcome is a really narrow, sort of already mapped out sort of route. So you have to get this type of degree, then you need this advanced degree, you need to publish, you need to meet this type of person, you need to have these kinds of fellowships. Whatever that narrow idea is about how you get to that outcome, throw it out. That's not to say that you, some of those things are things you genuinely want to do, um, but I think that when you are leaning into your passion, you see all the other routes. There's so many ways to get to the destination. And I think if you Align yourself with the method that works best for you or comes most naturally to you, then you will get to that outcome faster. Um, so those are my two sort of pieces of advice. They both sort of speak to passion and interest and really being in dialogue with yourself about what you want. And even if it is to be a curator, knowing why you're motivated to do that, what kind of curator you want to be, what kind of institution you want to work for and why. And then once you've sorted that out, full steam ahead, Think about all the different routes to the thing you want and which route makes you, uh, makes you most comfortable and plays to your strengths best. Um, there's an abstract painter uh, named Serge Helena. Um, he's from Martinique. Um, he studied in France and then he went on to move to the Ivory Coast where he established a school and a practice. Um, he also taught um, in Senegal. Essentially, he lives in West Africa, in Francophone, West Africa, for a couple of decades and then back. And so I find his work to be uh, incredibly impressive and a bit unsung. Um, and producing a survey, or even an abbreviated survey of his work, he's been working since the late 50s, um, is something that I have great interest in. Um, and I find that his personal journey between, you know, Francophone Korea to Europe to Africa 
sort of echoes this cultural exchange between those three continents um, and shows how, and, and sort of reveals the ways in which those, each respective region influenced the others, especially in 1960s and 70s art. Um, and so he is sort of a, a single example of a, a broader phenomenon, and I think his work's brilliant. Um, I've been looking forward to collaborating with um, some of the young and emerging artists uh, working in Congo, Kinshasa. Um, there are so many artists there that are incredibly talented working in all media. Uh, and as I mentioned, our collection sort of already establishes us as, uh, as content experts uh, in historical and cultural objects from the DRC. And so creating exhibitions with some of these artists or collecting some of these artists or otherwise collaborating on things that create a platform um, that allows for us to sort of gain new and deeper meanings from our existing collection um, and to present a through line of the historical to the contemporary uh, in that region are really of interest for me. Thanks so much for joining me and for submitting your questions. Stay safe and we hope to see you soon at the hub.